it's a Meat Eater Podcast. Welcome to Meat Eater Trivia, the only game show where conservation always wins. I'm your host, Spencer Newhart, and today we're joined by Steve Rinella, Clay Newcomb, Brent Reeves, Hunter Spencer, Jason Phelps, Paul Lewis, Dave Smith, and Brad Cochran. This is a 10-round quiz show with questions from Meat Eaters for Verticals, which are hunting, fishing, conservation, and cooking, and there is a prize. Meat Eater will donate $500 to the conservation organization of the winner's choosing. Now, Dave and Brad, this is your first time playing Meat Eater Trivia. How do you think you're going to do? I'm going to bomb. You think so? (laughs) My confidence is at an all-time low. (laughs) Okay. Um, This reminds me of, like, high school report that's due the next morning, and I've been Uh checking traps all morning and stuff, so... (laughs) You that, that could help you in this game, though. It could help. Well, the thing is, is like I might know the answer, but I will just freaking lock up and panic, <laughs> like when I can't remember like my uncle's name or something. You know, I'm just like, but you know what? I'm gonna get through it. Okay. Before the show, I was saying Dave didn't have much confidence, and he said I was giving him too much credit. He has zero confidence, uh, is yeah. what he's declared. Brad, how you think you're gonna do a meat eater trivia? Uh, topic is hunting, fishing, conservation, cooking. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, I might do okay. I was worried you were going to say, like, we were going to talk about Einstein's theory of relativity mm, or something. Yeah, no. In which Ooh, case, I hope so. I probably wouldn't do so well. I'd be satisfied if I could figure out a way to ask that question. Um, it's not in today's round, but yeah, may, maybe someday I could okay, fit that fair in. fair enough. Uh, Paul, did you ever think about naming your company the Paul Lewis Gear, like Phelps and uh, uh, Dave here did? <laughs> we, <laughs> we had this conversation earlier. You I, did? Uh, yeah, we... Uh, we FHF. I wish I would have thought that through and made uh-huh. it something a little easier to pronounce. Yeah. But uh, Fuff Gear doesn't say, roll off the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> now, each week here on Trivia, we reveal a new stat for the stat of the week this week. We're looking at the prevalence of the name David Smith in America. David wow. Smith is the second most popular full name in the United States. Do you have any guesses as to what is first? John Smith. John Smith. Yep. That's not it. Any other guesses as to what the first most popular name is? You have Smith right. Really? George. Oh, awesome. Paul? Joseph. George. No. Uh, James Smith is the most popular James. full wow. name. So you guys flirted with the right answer, but you didn't quite get it. It's estimated there are 42,000 David Smiths living in America right now. That means you could take every David Smith in the country, sell out Wrigley Field with just David Smiths, and still have enough David Smiths left over to play a baseball game against each other. <laughs> wow. And you could page wow. David Smith. <laughs> yeah. See what happens. Dave, how many Dave Smiths do you know? Uh, I know I know a couple, for sure, uh-huh. um, even now, uh, which is cool. But I just remember my best friend in grade school, his name was Tim Jones, and we'd like get caught, you know, climbing up on top of the roof or something like that. Uh-huh. And they'd catch us and they said, What are you guys' names? And we'd be like, Dave Smith, Tim Jones. And like, What are your real names? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Alias Smith and Jones. <laughs> yeah, Alias Smith and Jones. Now, also on the show, we have an infrequently asked question segment where we answer fan questions about trivia. This week, our question comes from Clay Newcomb. Clay, what's your question? <laughs> well, I, okay, so I, I don't know a, what he's a lot, ask. There's, a, there's a lot of stuff thrown around about like who's the best at this game, mm-hmm. you know, like wins, losses, all this. Yep. I, I am I'm interested in percentage of wins per times you've been in the game. Yep. And I think I've got a shot. I can't tell you the answer off the top of my head. I've covered it before. But Clay, you're mm-hmm. top three. You're, you're like That's right I, there. I feel like I win a lot. Yeah, Clay does very well. He also doesn't play that <laughs> often. You get like no credit. <laughs> we, we give you your credit. Uh, <laughs> a, another strong performer who doesn't play all that often is Tony Peterson. Yeah. Uh, you and Tony good. both do well. Uh, we could use more Clay and more Tony on If on Steve trivia. and Brody aren't here, I, mm-hmm. I have a chance. Yeah, you're right up there, Clay. You told me, Spencer told me early on, he just nailed it. He was like, Clay, your weakness is cooking. Yeah. Well, and fishing. You admitted I have two that, weaknesses. Though, the cooking. <laughs> I've seen you cook. Only True. half the game. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Only half the game is his weakness. <laughs> now, for the housekeeping portion of today's show, I want to have Steve share a story that I heard at his birthday party over the weekend. One of Steve's old college mm. roommates explained how Steve developed a foolproof way from of keeping a house party from getting busted by the cops. <laughs> and while Steve has contributed many great things to the hunting and fishing community, I'm convinced this will be his greatest contribution of all. Steve, tell folks that story. Uh, it started out where we were coming back from fishing, um, steelhead 
on the Pier Marquette River, and someone in front of us hit a deer. And I kept the deer and took it back. I was living, I was in school and living in Grand Rapids, Michigan. What was, time of year? Uh, it was late. It was later in the year, maybe late May, early June. I can't quite remember. Or it might have been like now and then you'd get some Chinook up in. I can't. We were, we were fishing the PM. Okay. Because now and then you get some Chinook in that river. You'd get Chinook sometimes in July, mm-hmm. which is weird. Either way, we're fishing that river. That makes more sense. Either way, guy hits a deer. And I'd, get, I'd take the deer and I'd take it back. And I was living in kind of a flop house. Like none of the people in the house were on the lease. <laughs> and none of the people in the house even really knew who the house was rented from. It was just people rotated in and out. And uh-huh. I was on an in rotation. And it was friends of mine that lived there. And we had an idea we were going to take the deer I had and so cut it up and sew it into a pig and have a pig roast. And somehow I found out that you could do a block party, you could a family reunion could block the road off for some roads. So I registered a family reunion under an alias that I still use. David Smith. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> and sure enough, the cops came. Like, what was the scene of this place? Like, how many kids were there? I assume many, oh, many underage. Oh, like way over 100. Yeah, many like underage. Like, a lot of people were there. Uh-huh. Broad daylight. And we had a big sign that said, the blank, blank family reunion. <laughs> and, and and lo and behold, the cops did show up. We did tell them, oh, it's our family reunion. Well, well that's the, pu- the punchline of the whole thing <laughs> is you saying... That a cops never break up a family reunion. Yeah. That was the funny part. Uh-huh. And then and, he went and did this. And my buddy remembers that when the cop did come, the cop observed that I think my brother's in there. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, well, you must know so-and-so. Must be part of the family. That's, that's, uh, that's an incredible story, uh, Steve. So in registering your family reunion party, mm-hmm. no one actually does any research to find out if, in fact, they take you at face value uh-huh. when you tell them that you're having a family reunion yeah. and that you need to block your road off. That is, uh, that is something that's going to be used on college campuses around the country uh, this spring, Steve. It's a great piece of advice. Now, the Shelby Index for today's round is a four, so our winner should get eight correct answers. And with that, we're on to the game of trivia. Play the drop, Phil. Look, I need to know what I stand to win. Everything. How's that? You just tend to win everything. Game on, suckers! Question one, the topic is conservation, and this will be multiple choice. Which of these endangered species... What can I interrupt? What do you got? <laughs> oh. <laughs> You should tell everybody about how what we did with the, the what we did at the in Portland. Yeah, so uh, our hundredth episode came out, and we tried a new style of meat eater trivia that we're referring to as meat pull, where I survey hunters and anglers, um, and they answer a question one of two ways, and then uh, the people in here predict their answers. We did this at the Portland uh, PNW Sportsman's Show, where I walked around and I surveyed over 100 people who were attending this event, asked them questions like, do you believe in Bigfoot? Does your hunting dog sleep in bed? Um, would you rather be attacked by an alligator or a mountain lion? Uh, the most stunning Hmm. piece of data we got, we gathered, I think was, do you believe in Bigfoot? Well, Spencer, without realizing it, or maybe (laughs) with realizing it, was doing his survey in very close proximity to the Bigfoot booth. Yeah, I've, I've been to... Uh, there was a Bigfoot uh, Believer this booth. This is how stuff gets... Uh-huh. There's a Bigfoot Believer it's booth. Fun. So he comes back, he's like, 40% of people believe in Bigfoot. Uh-huh. I'm like, yeah, at the Bigfoot booth. <laughs> you go to the other side of the room. <laughs> yeah, I've been to like a half dozen of these types of shows. I've never seen booth space dedicated to Bigfoot, uh, but the Portland show... Had one. Now, also mind you, Washington leads the country in Bigfoot sightings. Um, it's just a it's just mm-hmm. a Bigfooty area. Uh, but forty one percent of people at this event who were buying calls from Jason Phelps and buying gear from Paul and, and Dave Smith decoys, they believed in Bigfoot. Forty one percent. Forty one percent. How many people were joking when they said it though? Well, you know, it's the opposite way, Clay. People would like um, they were kind of bashful about saying that they did believe in Bigfoot. Depending on who okay. was around them, they'd be like. 
yeah, mark me down. Uh, or they'd like kind of, they'd eye who, who could hear their answer and they would, they would say yes. Well, that's why, that's why Trump polled low in 2016. Oh, okay. People didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to fight about it. Well, so what, uh, later when they're like, how were the polls so wrong? <laughs> a lot of people were like, yeah, I don't feel like arguing about it. Mm-hmm. I was going to act like I like someone I don't. Yeah. Meanwhile, mm. I learned that 8% of people there believed that the moon landing was faked. Um, which is lower than the national average, but uh, they they far exceed the amount of people who believe in Bigfoot. So uh, they have their conspiracy theory, and that's Bigfoot. Uh, but but don't bother asking about a moon landing. They don't wow. buy it. Question one: The topic is conservation. This is multiple choice. Which of these endangered species has the highest population in the wild? Is it blue whales, California condors, red wolves? Or black-footed ferrets. Which of these endangered species has the highest population in the wild? Your four choices. Blue whales, California condors, red wolves, black-footed ferrets. Now, Dave, you were quick to answer. Is that just to, like, get it over with? Or do you know this one? Um, it was to get it over with. Okay. Dave, give me a little peek what you got, buddy. <laughs> Steve agrees. Uh, waiting on Hunter and Jason. Blue whales, California condors, red wolves, black-footed ferrets. Which of those has the highest population in the wild? Is everybody ready? Go ahead and reveal your answers. We have Dave saying blue whales. Paul saying blue whales. Brent saying black-footed ferrets. And he drew us uh, a raccoon-looking black-footed ferret. Phelps saying Why'd black you draw a raccoon footed. there? Well, I did that before he that asked the his, question. That was his mascot. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was his mascot. Phelps saying logo. black footed ferrets. Hunter saying blue whales. Clay saying blue whales. Brad saying black footed ferrets. Steve saying blue whales. The correct answer is blue whales. Yes. About half of you got that right. It's estimated that in the wild there are 35 red wolves, 350 California condors. 450 black-footed ferrets, and 15,000 blue whales. Oh, blue whales close. is one of those ones yeah. that they put on the, that they give endangered species protection to because they feel like it ought to be. Mm-hmm. It's like the, with the new Wolverine one. Sure. They feel like it ought to be endangered. Yeah, a lot of ocean critters are given a little more leeway. Than the, uh, or they're the like, I wish species. it was endangered because it'd be sweet if we could put it on the endangered species list. The greatest Mm. threats to blue whales are vessel strikes, entanglement in fishing gear, pollution, and ocean noise. Blue whale populations are on the rise, and biologists are starting to see them return to places they were once extirpated. Let's go. Question two. The topic is biology. This next great question comes to us via David Escobales. This eight-letter word is defined as, quote, the hard upper shell of a turtle or crustacean. Steve knows it. He's, uh, well, I got to count. Okay, he's, he's doing the, the hangman method. Here's Could the you question repeat the again. question? This eight-letter word is defined as the hard upper shell of a turtle or crustacean. Do you have to spell it right? You don't have to spell it right, uh, but I hope you have eight letters, folks. <laughs> I think that anything that has to do with how you spell it uh-huh. should be spelled right. Mm. Not We're not going to make you That'd spell it right. That'd be a good right. genre of question. Just spelling. No, be like a type of question. How do you spell mm. and then give a biological term? We did that once. Oh, you did? Um, it was... I don't think... We did the I'm winning the word letter. from the kid's spelling bee, which was moorhen, um, which is a way to describe it? a coot. We had you spell moorhen. It's the only time in meat eater history, uh, we've now had like 1,100 questions, the only time where spelling has mattered. Here's the question again. This eight-letter word is defined as, quote, the hard upper shell of a turtle or crustacean. Who thinks they have it right? The room does not look confident. You're coming up with seven letters? Yeah. Are you writing top shell? No. Oh. <laughs> Wait a minute. Eight letter word. Steve is the only one who has any confidence. <clears throat> hmm. I know I got it right. Okay. Is everybody ready? Go well, ahead and reveal you want, your answers. No. Can you do the book? Can I get extra credit for the bottom? Uh, no. We have Dave saying Turtle House. <laughs> <laughs> Paul without an answer. Brent saying Epic Crust. Oh, wow. That was a good answer. Tight. Phelps without an answer. Hunter saying Mollusk. Clay saying Exoskeleton. Spelled he ran wrong. a few words over, or a few wrong. letters over. Uh, Brad without an answer. Or Brad saying Exoshell. 
Steve saying carapace. Steve got it. The correct mm. answer uh, is carapace. Oh, man. The carapace is the exoskeleton on the dorsal side of a turtle, while the plastron is the shield on the ventral side. Typically, a male's plastron will be concave, and a female's plastron will be convex, which helps them during breeding. Also, a female's plastron is usually muted in color, which is one of the best ways to identify the sex of a turtle. Hmm. Question. Hit me with that again, that last tidbit. Uh, so if you look at the bottom of a turtle shell, mm -hmm. if it's very vibrant in color, that's likely a male. If it's very muted in color, that's likely a female. I didn't know that. Now sure. you can go out there sex and turtles. Well, you know, it's <laughs> not <laughs> like, like a... a blue crab. <laughs> you, read that, you read that somewhere? You know that. No, I read that. It's like a blue crab's got the blue bottom. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Mm. Question three. That's a great little tidbit. Question it's three. True. The topic is foraging. <laughs> What vulgar name is often used to describe half-free morel mushrooms? The room is stumped. The topic is foraging. What vulgar name is often used to describe half-free morel mushrooms? Half-free. Half-free. you describe what that means? Like poking not, through the... Not going to help you out. Uh, half-free is what some folks would refer to this type of mushroom. But there's a vulgar nickname that goes along with it. What vulgar name? What if I had a moral, um, like, like, uh, <laughs> just tell me what like, like, who's the guy from, you know, the guy from Tennessee that wouldn't fight in World War II? Um, yeah. Mm hmm. A Quaker. Yeah. So you know mm -hmm. the answer, you're saying? I know the answer, but I, I have moral okay. obligations to saying it. I'd like the point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you so can you hand. No, but you don't want to put it down. Right? I'm kidding. I don't know. <laughs> But what, would it be uh, below you, Clay, to write it down? If, well, I guess it depends how vulgar it is, right? Okay. It depends. Steve, do you have this one right? You're the only one who's come up with an answer. I feel like I probably got it, maybe. Okay. What vulgar name is often used to describe half-free morel mushrooms? This may stump the room. This is question three. I'm just going to come up with something vulgar. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's, I'm, it's I'm a good to strategy. If I should... is going to write the worst thing he can think of. <laughs> That's a good strategy. Yeah, see, where I'm at is I'm not even wanting to explore. Uh -huh. I'm like, because well, I mean, like, what am I going to write? This is a lose lose Clay, for me. Your mom would want you to win, buddy. <laughs> you think so? It's like, yeah. your mom okay, would Juju, want, here we go. Yeah, <laughs> she, she would wait if you don't do it uh -huh. out of respect for your upbringing and let your mom down by losing. She'd be like, yeah. It's okay, sweetie. Clay, who would you donate to if you won? Um,. The Western Bear Federation, or found, they something need like you. that. I've, right? I've, I have donated yeah. to them before and to Howl. Do it for uh, them. So do it Howl. for them, Clay. Think about all those bears, uh, all that bad legislation, and then write down a bad word. And then think about you sitting in hell. <laughs> <laughs> With uh, the decoy makers. My, my right? wife the healthy population show. of bears above you. <laughs> Does everybody uh, have an answer? <laughs> <laughs> Now, Brent, it's like a level of vulgar where I'm comfortable reading it on the podcast. Uh, so, yeah, maybe use that for your judgment. Yeah, my, your... my, my wife watches this show. <laughs> okay. Can I, can I just say, like, from a, like a scale from 1 to 10 on a vulgar scale, it's like a 2. Yeah, it's, yeah, not, it's, it's not that oh, bad. Oh, say, oh, I'm, I'd say I'm like way a three. off <laughs> <laughs> Okay, is everybody ready? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and reveal your answers. We have Dave saying... <laughs> <laughs> I'll skip Dave. Paul saying turtle head. Uh, that'd just be a little treat for the YouTube audience. Yeah. They can see Dave's answer. Brent saying, lo and behold. Phelps <laughs> saying gnome dick. Uh, Hunter saying bastard, uh, which is that's like on the right level of uh, thinking. Clay saying the female name for a dog. No, no, no. I actually didn't oh, have got? any. I mean, it, it was arbitrary. Okay. Uh, Brad saying world. I that. like that. Steve uh, saying peckerheads. Steve got it. Hey! The correct uh, answer is peckerhead or dog pecker mushroom. Juju, I was not thinking that word. <laughs> it was a joke, me putting all the little... <laughs> peckerhead morels are edible, but resemble some look-alikes that are toxic. Peckerheads smell and taste like morels and can be cooked in a similar fashion. They tend to have a longer stem than morels, with the top of the cap being connected directly to the stem. Peckerheads are a good indicator that you're in the right area at the right time to find morels. Steve, so you knew that one. Have you seen peckerheads out in the wild? Mm -hmm. Have you ever picked them and eaten them? Mm -mm. You haven't. You just stay away from, from peckerhead mushrooms. Uh, 
I didn't. I, I'm familiar with them, but I had them lumped under the falsies. Yeah, it's probably it's a safe way to forage. Um, but if you knew what you were looking at, you could take a pecker head. Why well, you got to try to make a little knock on me? I don't think I was. Oh, you're like, oh yeah, but if you knew what you were looking. <laughs> <laughs> question four. The topic is hunting. This is our listener question of the week, which was won by Andrew Washburn for sending this great question. Andrew is going to get a board game signed by the crew. If you want a chance to win our listener question of the week, then send your question to trivia at the meateater.com. The topic is hunting. What Greek hunter can be seen in the night sky aiming a bow at a bull? Brent and Paul, they know this one. Steve looks confident as well. What Greek hunter can be seen in the night sky aiming a bow at a bull? Brent, you have this one right? It's a toss-up between two. Okay. Are you disappointed in Clay for not having an answer yet? I think no, you should know this I one. am. Clay is disappointed in Clay. What Greek hunter can be seen in the night sky aiming a bow at a bull? Steve. I have no idea so bad. how to spell what I'm trying to say. <laughs> There's a hint. Steve is just going to keep the perfect game going. Do you have this one right? I think I got her. Okay. <clears throat> Steve thinks he I has didn't have it. any trouble spelling it, so it's probably wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's helpful. <laughs> you guys want to? Uh, my my buddy the other night said, "Man, I can't even." We were talking about AI, and he goes, "I can't even barely spell AI." <laughs> <laughs> Clay and Brent, you got any more hints to trade each other here? No, we got it. We should have. We should have talked earlier. <laughs> Come up with your hand signs. Chili. Uh-huh. Chili. Oh, Speak check this me. out. Uh, <clears throat> my buddy, uh, the blue collar scholar, Tommy uh-huh. Edson. He doesn't live in a cold climate, mm-hmm. but he was over here in Montana, and he texts me. He says, "How do you people deal with the pissers on your windshield wipers freezing up?" And I said, "Well, you got to buy really low temp mm-hmm. fluid." <clears throat> He started thinking he was going to dump a bottle of cheap vodka <clears throat> in there. And he went into the store, and instead of buying like some Smirnoff or Popov or something, it occurred to him to put some uh, isopropyl alcohol okay. in there, and he swore that that fixed the problem. It did it. Mm-hmm. Maybe it created another problem, though. That's what I'm waiting to hear. <laughs> Flammable. Does, <clears throat> does everybody have an answer for the Greek hunter that can be seen in the night sky aiming a bow at a bull? Go ahead and reveal oh. your answers. We have Dave saying Dimitri, Paul saying Orion, Brent oh, saying over- Nimrod, Phelps saying he Socrates. Spelled, he spelled Socrates wrong. <laughs> Hunter saying Apollo, Clay saying Poseidon, uh, Brad saying Zeus. Steve saying Orion. Orion. The correct answer is Orion. Mm. We had Dave and Steve Paul and, and Steve. Paul. Paul. I'm sorry, Paul and Steve get that one right. Good I job, told guys. you it was between two. That was the other one you were uh, yeah. debating between them. But okay. I, I decided against it because I kept thinking Orion's belt for some reason. It's he good. was wearing one of those. Yeah, he's got FHF a belt. Gear What's belts. weird is he's packing a bow, <laughs> So, <laughs> but he's got a sword too. Yeah. Oh really? Mm-hmm. Some some cultures depict him as holding a shield instead of a bow, and then he's got a sword or a club. Um, I like the the bow version of it. I think he's got a fish bonker. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> According to Greek mythology, Orion was a legendary hunter who was banished to the sky for boasting about how many animals he could kill. Now he Whoa. and his two hunting dogs eternally chase Taurus the bull, but are never able to catch him. Orion can be used for navigation in the northern hemisphere by looking at his belt, which roughly runs east to west. Hmm. Question five. The topic is gear. Hmm. What state is the Great American Outdoor Show held in? That's a real give me. This will be a, a bone to our, uh, I don't know, maybe if you like own a, a business that makes outdoor gear, uh, this would potentially help you. So what you're state? We shouldn't get this wrong. That what was, state? You're throwing a bone to the whole room. <laughs> what if you can't spell the state? <laughs> don't give a hint. Like there's, there's, a, there's a little hint from Clay. Uh, Brent has a blank board right now. Uh, and a blank stare. <laughs> what state is the Great American Outdoor Show held in? This is question five. We'll Brent, get just try to think. Board. What's the greatest American state? <laughs> it's going to Arkansas. See, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like, I didn't know they had that in Arkansas. Uh-huh. Like when you think of America, 
What state <laughs> pops in your mind? The Great American Outdoor Show. I'm going back with my original. Is everybody America. ready? America. Go ahead and reveal your answers. We have Dave saying Illinois, Paul saying Pennsylvania. When you Brent. close your eyes and think of America, Massachusetts pops <laughs> into your head? No. <laughs> Arkansas does. Brent saying Massachusetts. Phelps saying Pennsylvania. Hunter, Clay, Brad, and Steve saying Pennsylvania. They got it. The correct answer is Pennsylvania. The nine-day event wrapped up in early February. The Great American Outdoor Show is the world's largest outdoor expo. It's estimated that over 200,000 people attended the event to see over 1,000 exhibitors. The show has been held in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania since 1956. That's where I met Buck Bowden. Oh, you Mm -hmm. guys just hit it off. Mm Mm-hmm. There you are today with that big old moose upstairs now. Was, was, was no, that, I had no, nothing to do with Buck. Nothing, okay. <laughs> Buck doesn't get any credit for that big old moose. How many of you guys been to the Great American Outdoor Show in Harrisburg? I've never been. Stephen Brad, that's it. Okay. Phil, we're halfway through the game of trivia. Give us a scoreboard update. Sure thing. Brent, I'm so sorry. Big old goose egg. You've yet to make Cow, Brent. Man, <laughs> impression that's, on the board. It's worse than I <laughs> normally do. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, Dave, and Brad all have one point apiece. Hunter Spencer and Clay Newcomb have two. Paul Lewis has three. And in first place with a perfect game, it's Steven Ranella. Perfect game for Steve. Question six. The topic is fishing. This next great question is via Dustin Bins. The furthest inland this fish has ever been documented in North America is near Alton, Illinois, on the Mississippi River. The topic is fishing. The furthest inland this fish has ever been documented in North America is near Alton, Illinois, on the Mississippi River. You're looking for a lot of specificity here? Yeah, Yeah, sure. If you think the answer is white-tailed deer, you need to say white-tailed deer. I would put that down. (laughs) What if we just said deer? Uh, That would not be good enough. You need to to put white-tailed deer. (laughs) Paul, Steve, and Clay all were quick to answer. Clay, do you know this one? I'm um, like 85%, 80. Okay. You didn't just write down deer. That's right. Okay. Dave, can I have that decoy right there? Absolutely. What's special about that one? That's a true it's, it's nice three-quarter and, and strut. I like, and I like the stand. Mm. Seven-eighths strut. Seven-eighths strut. <laughs> it's hard to walk in this room without kicking a decoy at this point. Hey, the the room looks really good since the last time I've been here. Oh, you ain't seen nothing yet, dude. We got a lot of work doing here. (laughs) Phil Phil wants to paint the whole thing. Really? He don't Mm. like the white. Me and Phil are going to paint this whole place. White, white. Yeah, it's kind of bright. We're going to roll it with a roller. Okay. Here's the question again. What color? Phil can't decide. (laughs) If it was darker, it'd be a little warmer. Yeah, I'm thinking like a a dark, like forest green, maybe like a dark blue. Oh. What I might, uh, what Navy we might, I'll, I'll see about having a sign up where you can volunteer to come. Pay. It's going to be called Paint with Stephen Phil. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and HR, will, it'll be like thing you sign up on an HR. Yeah. But you have and to be have a like professional sandwiches. painter. No, just you come and help take shit down, paint, and hang stuff back up. Yeah, me and me and Steve are going to be like Tom Sawyer. <laughs> we could we could do it in a half day. Yeah, I'll be like, I don't know, man. I don't know if I want you painting the walls in here. And you'd be like, Come on, dude, let me paint. <laughs> you need a mural, Steve. A mural of what? I mean, just something really cool. Uh-huh. I'm a big mural guy. This is the question one more time. This is question six. The furthest inland this fish has ever been documented in North America is near Alton, Illinois, on the Mississippi River. Is everybody ready? Go ahead and reveal your answers. We have Dave saying Atlantic salmon, Paul saying Baskin's shark, Brent saying Asian carp, Phelps saying swordfish. Hunter saying channel cat, Clay saying tiger shark, Brad saying bull shark, Steve saying bull shark. We have a correct answer in the room. It's bull shark, Ah, Steve uh, and Brad. That's a bunch of bull shark. (laughs) The bull shark was caught about 1,000 miles from the Gulf of Mexico by two commercial fishermen in 1937. They They noticed their mesh nets were getting raided by a large predator, so they built a wire trap and baited it with chicken guts. What they expected to be a muskie turned out to be a bull shark that was five feet long and 80 pounds. For more on this story, read my article on TheMeatEater.com called Could There Actually Be Bull Sharks in the Midwest? Wow. Question I'd seven. I'd have been better off just saying. Man, deer. I knew the story, but I didn't know it was in the 30s. 1937. Yeah. 
There's uh, there's even photographic evidence. Otherwise, uh, it probably wouldn't be verified the way it is. Question seven. The topic is hunting. What migratory bird goes by nicknames such as tar bellies and giggle chickens? What migratory bird goes by nicknames such as tar bellies and giggle chickens? This is question seven. This may ruin Steve's perfect game. He has not picked up his whiteboard yet. What migratory bird goes by nicknames such as tar bellies and giggle chickens? Uh, we have Brad and Dave, who appear to be confident. Hunter is joining them now. Clay, you uh, feel good about your answer? Well, I, I'm a little gun shy after bullshit. Okay. Yeah. Arkansas probably has all kinds of things you guys call giggle chickens, would be my guess. <laughs> yeah. Most yeah. of them are relatives. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good one, Brent. Damn it, man. Got a good game going. Have you uh, come up with an answer yet? Yeah, but I don't like it. Okay, Steve doesn't like what he wrote down. This is question seven. Is everybody ready? I'm as ready as I'm going to be. Steve is not ready. I'm not going to get it. I don't know what it is. Go ahead and reveal your answers. We have Dave saying Pacific White Front Speckle Belly. Paul saying Goose. Brent saying Speckle Belly Geese Phelps without an answer. Hunter saying Speckle Belly. Clay saying speckled belly goose. Brad saying white fronted goose. Steve saying loon. The correct answer is speckled belly geese or greater white fronted geese. Uh, the room did very well, really rubbing it into Steve. He did mm. not get that one right. <laughs> uh, I, uh, really quick apologies. Uh, who wrote white fronted geese? Brad and uh, Dave. Great. They got that okay, one right. Awesome. Other nicknames for speckle bellies include specks, bar bellies, laughing geese, and white fronts. They're known for their distinctive salt and pepper markings on their breasts, as well as their high-pitched hee-hee cackle. The only banded bird I ever shot was a speckle belly in South Dakota, which was banded in the Arctic Circle. Dave Smith makes tar belly decoys, but they're currently out of stock. Man, we hunt them just like ducks back home. I mean, they'll work into decoys just like ducks will. Now imagine if you had some Dave Smith decoys. Oh, it'd be were, murder. Uh, oh, yeah. If I had to paint them pla blaze orange. <laughs> they wouldn't stand a chance. Do you guys sell a lot of speckle belly decoys? Is that like a very, very niche market or, or bigger than you'd think? Oh, we sell a lot of them. Yeah, um, they're popular in the South and California, but there are a lot of late spec seasons now um, throughout the Midwest and, and Northwest, and a lot of guys will freelance in Canada where there are a lot of specs, mm. so... And just for the record, I didn't put greater white fronted goose because there's also a lesser. Mm. Mm. They're found in Europe. Ooh. You got that one right, though. Steve, do you feel, uh, how do you feel about not getting that one? Man, like, I, I didn't really know what to put down. Did your homunculus know? No. no. And then, but what I did know is that these boys answered it so fast. <laughs> I was like, it's definitely something they hunt. Uh huh. And then I just kind of clammed up. Went with a loon. <laughs> Question eight the topic yeah, so, is cooking. So you're saying you, you thought that we hunt loons? <laughs> No, no, I knew I was wrong, and like how cockily they answered it, I was like, uh, it's, it's like they're definitely intimate. Mm -hmm. They're intimate. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I knew it wasn't a loon. Question not eight. That they're not intimate with loons, but there's just like a cockiness I picked up. <laughs> the topic is cooking. This next great question is via Tony Estrada. What's the six-letter name of the bowl used for crushing and grinding ingredients for food and cocktails? What's the six-letter name of the bowl used for crushing and grinding ingredients for food and cocktails? The room looks very confident. We will get a scoreboard update from Phil the Engineer after this. This is question eight. What's wrong, Phelps? There's... It's very clearly explained, but I don't know if I knew which one's mm, which now. Okay. Yep. He's, yeah. he's encountered... A Potential trick. Oh. Oh, oh, man, no. just help me. Yeah, man. Like, like, like <laughs> oh, I don't. <laughs> it's like, wait, you he, know, he it, like, no, I was saying gonna... it. If if you're saying something, you know it, or else you can't say it. <laughs> I, I was gonna be. So quiet, there's no he point like, in saying it. I feel like it was dug out of me there. <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Yeah, we we waterboarded Jason. <laughs> I felt like I was call, I, was, I was thinking what you just said. Like, no, I probably and just then, switched mine and got it wrong. I hope so. Mm. Uh, yeah, for the record, Clay did change his answer. Uh, <laughs> I did, 100%. on what Jason uh, said. I, I feel like I, 
I could get out of this in court. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the question again. What is, what's the six letter name of the bowl used for crushing and grinding ingredients? I don't think you've got anything to be afraid of, Steve. I'm losing this game. Is, it, is everybody ready? I think you're closer than you think, Clay. Go ahead and don't reveal spell, your don't answer. Spell it wrong. <laughs> we have Dave saying uh, Komai. Oh. Paul saying you better, you better Pestle. Pay attention to what he has. Brent saying Pestle. Phelps saying Pestle. Hunter saying mortar. Clay saying mortar. Brad without an answer. Steve saying mortar. The correct answer is mortar. Ah, I'm going to have to you, Google. Jason Phelps. Yes, you Kamai. Kamai. Is that uh, is that how you spell that indeed? I've I've never heard of yeah, that. That's for that's for Spanish speakers. But also you see it used. Uh when I Google your like when you're spelling, making a big old batch of guacamole, you're not using a mortar and pestle. You're using the same thing, but it's a comai. Hmm. Is it a Camila? No. Um Oh, well, you can have the point, Dave. I'm I'm not that passionate about it. <laughs> My Google result I, is yielding we, nothing. Uh, we, ha we have one at our house. Okay. My wife uses I, it all the time. I, I trust you. I don't know how you spell it. But. The pestle is the grinding club, while the mortar is the bowl. The oldest known pestle and mortar was found in Southwest Asia and dates back to 35,000 BC. Most early examples are small and handheld, but some versions that date back to 10,000 BC are big enough for a person to stand inside of. One of those large mortars from a cave in Israel is believed to be a spot where humans crushed cereal grains to brew beer. Phil, we have two questions left. Give us a leaderboard update. Uh, I'll just cut to the chase and say that Steven Ranella is the winner. Oh, really? Oh, okay. oh, <laughs> two fun. questions left. Make us feel we're, like we have we're a playing chance. For a second. I'm sorry. <laughs> we're, we're, we're on a tight schedule here. But uh, yeah, we've got, uh, yeah, the next person back, Clay and Hunter have four points apiece. They're in second place. It's battlegrounds over here. Question nine. The topic is natural history. This, history. this next great question is via Nate Parcell. This Native American tribe, which is part of the Iroquois Nation, has a hairstyle named after it. Question nine. Topic is natural history. We have a confident looking room. This Native American tribe, which is part of the Iroquois Nation, has a hairstyle named after it. Phelps, you have this one right? No, I was gonna I was going for the joke just real quick and then realized I probably <laughs> might know the answer. Okay. Clay, you know this one. I mean, I think so. Okay. I really uh, lost my confidence. Mm -hmm. Came in here talking about your uh, your great percentage of wins, and you let Steve take the victory with two yeah. questions. Well, I don't go. think I've ever beat Steve. Maybe once. Oh. Wow. But when he's not here, okay. which that's when I show up. All right. Here's the question one more time. This Native American tribe, which is part of the Iroquois Nation, has a hairstyle named after it. Is everybody ready? Go ahead and reveal your answers. We have Dave saying Mohawk. Paul saying Mohawk. Uh, the entire room said Mohawk. The room did Mo well. The entire room got it right. The correct answer is Mohawk. Phelps erased mullet. That was the, the joke he was going for. I almost wrote mullet. With Mohawk. At the time of European contact, the Mohawk, the Mohawk tribe was present in Vermont, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Quebec, and Ontario. They were the easternmost part of the Iroquois Confederacy. Some historians say the Mohawk haircut was an attempt by warriors to make their scalps a more attractive target for their enemies than those of the women and children. Wow. Question 10. The topic is wildlife. What Arizona Diamondback pitcher killed a dove with a oh, fastball yeah. during a 2001 spring training game? Phelps and Brent are very confident. Hunter's very confident. Steve has rolled his marker across the table. Can't come up with a sports ball player. It's a great video, though. You might just see it after what, this. What state? What Arizona Diamondback pitcher killed a dove with a fastball during a 2001 spring training game? That thing just obliterated. Mm -hmm. Poof. Who was that guy? <laughs> I'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> Dave Smith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's 42,000 of them to, uh, to choose from. Waiting on Steve to come up with an answer. Clay, you got this one right? No, no. not even close. I okay. just put my favorite picture. Oh, all right. That's one way to play. Ooh. Go ahead and reveal your answers. We have Dave saying Randy Johnson. Paul without an answer. 
Brent and Phelps and Hunter saying Randy Johnson. Clay saying Nolan Ryan. Brad saying Randy Johnson. Steve saying James Smith. Most popular <laughs> name in America. The correct answer <laughs> is Randy Johnson. The big unit. Play the yep. video, Phil. Did you get it right? I even Probably put his nickname it. down. <sighs> Incredible. I- I love that the crowd even. Like, what are the odds, man? Yeah. Well, you could probably figure it out. You have to figure <laughs> out how many pitches have ever been uh-huh. thrown and then put a one in front of that number with a colon. <laughs> Johnson God. was delivering a pitch to home plate when the dove flew in the path of his fastball. The catcher described the scene as, quote, an explosion. The pitch didn't count, and it's estimated the ball was traveling at 100 miles per hour when it struck the bird. A similar event happened during a Yankees game in Toronto in 1983 when Dave Winfield killed the seagull with a warm-up throw. Winfield was initially charged by Toronto police with animal cruelty, but the case was later dropped. Maybe they thought he was doing it on purpose. I don't know. You can't just go out winging fastballs at uh, seagulls on the beach, so... You know, I, I met uh, Bryant Gumble a long time ago. Oh. He was telling me how he killed a goose with a golf ball. Wow. Mm-hmm. By it's accident. A, one of my most I might be vivid messing that up. He killed, uh, no, he killed like a goose or a seagull with a golf ball. Yeah, geese love golf yeah, courses. You know. One of my most vivid childhood memories, I was on the first grade playground and the second grade playground was over here, separated by like a ditch. Uh-huh. And I picked up a rock and just chunked this rock into this empty field. There wasn't a child within like 50 yards. <laughs> and hit a kid. And the rock just arches through the air, and I see this kid just running. <laughs> and it's like slow motion, and he like, bam, hits him in the head. Kid goes down. <laughs> Did you fess up? No. Oh, really? <laughs> Still no, an unsolved nobody, crime. Nobody ever asked. <laughs> yeah, if there was a, I'm sorry, man, if there's a okay. kid out there. Uh Clay was nervous to write down Peckerhead on his whiteboard. <laughs> right. 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 Stoning I mean, a child. I mean, we're all full of hypocrisy. <laughs> <laughs> Steve is our winner. Uh, what, eight points, Steve? Uh, yeah. Eight points. Well done, Steve. Clay and Hunter couldn't catch him. What happens now is you get to choose where the $500 donation from Meat Eater goes. What's it going to be? Uh, for this round, I'm trying to think of if I did LAI last time I was down here. Or if I did TRCP. I was going to say you did NWTF recently. Maybe I that did do NWTF recently. Hey, what about turkeys for tomorrow? Well, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, um, I'm going to go. I'm going to do Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, okay. guaranteeing Americans quality places to hunt and fish. Mm-hmm. That's where I'm going. Five hundred dollars going to TRCP from Steve Ranella and Meat Eater with his eight correct answers. Brad, Dave, thanks for coming and playing. Uh, was was it as bad as you thought, Dave? Yep. Okay. <laughs> He's never going to play again. This is your one opportunity to hear one of the 42,000 Dave Smiths play Meat Eater trivia. Brad, so, how about you? Well, what was the final uh, tally? Uh, you'd have to ask Phil the engineer. Oh, would Steve win with eight? You know, I, you know what? I didn't mar- even mark down the Randy Johnson one because Steve won the game already. Uh, <laughs> oh. So well, well, did you get Randy Johnson, Brad? I did. Then you got five points. Oh, well done, Brad. Five out of ten. Okay, what place did I get? Uh, honestly, I, you were like tied for second or third. Okay. Yeah. So I can there you say go. I finished well, I got second place also. to Stephen Ronaldo. I think so tied. you and I, mm-hmm. we kind of hung in there a little bit. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe we'll let you and Dave and Brad team up next time. And you guys can see if Steve, you can... have you ever been defeated? Oh, many times. Oh, okay. It happens. It oh, happens. yeah. I'm like, uh, yeah. I, I lose You're all supposed time. to say no. No. And then I can say, I almost had him. I <laughs> lose a lot. Uh, I lose a lot. Um, there's a handful of people that beat me a lot. Uh-huh. And, and those, their names are Randall and Brody. When you tell the story, though, Brad, you can just tell it. Yeah, Steve has never lost before. He'd like that, I think. <laughs> Join us next time for more Meat Eater Trivia, the only game show where conservation always wins.